This is good. Y'all are learning. You can just go ahead and take a seat. I don't have to say anything at all. So it's good. Uh, how's everyone doing today? Good? Good? It's good. Uh, I saw in some eyes good, and some eyes were kind of just like uh, weary. So, and I, and I completely get that. So uh, I want to start before I jump in by just praying uh, relative to all that's going on. I feel like a pastoral prayer for our church and others is is necessary right here, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that um, in the midst of craziness, uh, you are still on the throne, and that um, we can cease our striving and be still and know that you're God, that we can run into your arms, that we can be welcomed into the cleft of the rock, and that um, we can... um, have some, some level of, of peace uh, relative to the fact that uh, we are not in charge. I pray, Lord, for those who are uh, weary uh, right now in our community from uh, sickness or caring for those around, for the medical folks. Um, I pray, Lord, for our nursing homes, uh, both Valley View as well as uh, the other ones, um, uh, William Penn and O'Hessen. Uh, I pray, Lord, for the workers there and also for the patients uh, I pray also, Father, for um, our area churches that are seeking to uh, represent the name of Jesus Christ uh, and, and uh, share that gospel message with folks in our community that, uh, as, as all of us, uh, just like here, are, are just working through how, how does that look in uh, November into December of 2020. Uh, I pray, Lord, that um, uh, the circumstances would not inhibit the message from going forward uh, for your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So um, when I was hired here uh, like a year ago, like another world ago, uh, when I was here, hired here, I had to go through these, uh, write out the answers to these two long questionnaires, and then I had like three or four interviews. But in that entire process, I kind of withheld one critical piece of information about me, which I'm about to share with y'all right now. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, before I share that, though, I have to ask this question. Uh, raise your hand if you have ever lived in uh, Yeagertown, Pennsylvania. Raise your hand. Anybody here lived in Yeagertown? Okay, so we got a couple. All right. Those people who have ever lived in Yeagertown, Pennsylvania, this will be like a little more pertinent to you, and now you're all even more curious, right? Um, here's the story. In uh, the summer of 1992... Uh, my cousins, uh, my, me, my sister, and my cousins were ushered into a convertible car in Yeagertown, and we were paraded through the streets of Yeagertown, Pennsylvania. And you're probably wondering why on earth that was the case. Uh, on the side of our convertible car, and I think that's the only time I ever in my life uh, rode in a convertible, so if you have a convertible, I'll just, just putting that out there. Um, I, uh, it's fine. Laughter is still fine. Um, on the side of our convertible car, it said uh, that these are the direct descendants of John Jacob Yeager, the founder of Yeagertown, Pennsylvania. So here, as I stand before you, uh, royalty, <laughs> royalty in your midst. Um, <laughs> I knew that. It's really funny to me. Um, so anyhow, uh, not sure how many of you have focused on your genealogy. Uh, I know I borrowed this from somebody, but you guys, some, some folks, uh, especially my, my Big Valley crew in here, uh, you might have recognized something like this. This is a genealogical history of Mo- Moses and Barbara Yoder Peachy and their descendants from 1759 to 2018. This is like a giant book of uh, genealogy. And so what, what I want to talk to you about today is, um, is genealogy and I know when I was a kid, uh, if you ever read in the Bible those uh, genealogical books, like you're like, okay, I'm going to start reading the New Testament, and you open up the New Testament, and you get to Matthew 1, there's like, this giant list of names, and you're like, I'm not sure if anyone could have created a more boring thing to read than just like, you know, so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so and what is going on here? Uh, but what I want to focus on today is why, why did genealogies matter, or why do people, some people take interest in them? And here's the point. I think a lot of us are interested in genealogies because fundamentally, as human beings, I think we all seek two things. And those two things are glory and relationship. Glory 
and relationship. And so we hope that in these genealogies we find there's some level of intimate relationship that's also related to somehow, you know, this is some great glorious thing that our ancestor has done or something like that. The problem, though, is this. <laughs> Most often in our lives, those two things, glory and relationships, are at conflict with each other. They're at conflict. And the reason why that is the case kind of makes sense because <laughs> if you know anyone who's just going on and on and on about their own glory, for example, they're standing up on a stage in front of church talking about how great it is that they're a descendant of the founder of Jaegertown. You're thinking to yourself, I mean, it's Jaegertown, right? Like, it's Jaegertown. <laughs> Just calm down. So, so we, we struggle with people who are seeking their own glory because we don't want to be in relationship to them. Or conversely, right, if we're in all these relationships and we can spend, you know, hours kind of looking through all the people we're related to, and I'll give you a hint for anybody of Big Valley folks, it's like pretty much everybody else, so I don't know if you need the book or not. But if you're in relation with all these people, you say, well, what's the point of all that? Like, what did any of those people do that's worth, you know, you talking about these relationships? Okay, so my goal today is to talk to you about how glory and relationship can coexist. And in order to do that, we're going to use the, the, the little four-chapter book of Ruth, often overlooked book of Ruth. So um, before we get into the text of Ruth, let me just situate us where we are on our kind of biblical Old Testament timeline, all right? So uh, last week, we uh, kind of met and talked through Moses in a whirlwind fashion, which did not do that whole story justice, but it's what we, what we could do. And so Moses uh, led the people out of Egypt, across the Red Sea. Uh, they did not go into the Promised Land immediately. They wandered for 40 years. You might remember that story. And then eventually, uh, Moses' successor, Joshua, leads them into the Promised Land. That's oftentimes called the Conquest. So now the nation of Israel is in the Promised Land. They're kind of settled there. Uh, but this is the time before there's any king. So this is before Saul, David, and all the rest of the kings. And so we call this the time of Judges. And if you ever read the book of Judges, which I highly recommend, that's my second favorite Old Testament book, uh, the book of Judges, what you'll find in there is a whole bunch of crazy stories where the nation of Israel keeps getting redeemed, but in their redemption, they just keep cycling downward and getting worse and worse and worse. And by the end of the book of Judges, you're like, who are these people? They're just a hot, hot, hot mess. Okay, that's the end of the book of Judges. We'll kind of during that same time, and the book of Ruth starts out in the time of the judges, so during that same time, we come across the book of Ruth. Okay, so how does the book of Ruth go? As it's introduced, we meet uh, one of the main characters, that is Naomi. And Naomi is married to a guy, and his name is Elimelech, and they live in Bethlehem. Anybody take notice? Christmas is on its way. They live in Bethlehem. And um, Naomi and Elimelech, have two sons, and there's an issue because there's a famine in the land of Israel. So they have to leave Israel to go to a place where there's enough food, and so they go to the land of Moab. And you can hopefully see on this map, that basically just means they go up and around and down uh, onto the other side of the Dead Sea into the land of Moab. While in Moab, the, uh, the two sons marry Moabite women. We just assume there's no Israelite women, they're going to get married, so they marry locals because that's who's there. Right, so they marry these two, uh, these two women. Um, catastrophe strikes. So Naomi, she already had catastrophe in Israel, so the famine, so she had to leave. Well, now significant ca catastrophe strikes this family. Because, and we can't exactly understand this. We can get a sense of it in our world now. But in that world, uh, this is catastrophic because basically all of the guys die. Elimelech and both the sons all die, and here's these three women left alone. And in that time and in that era, that's a very, very, very vulnerable place. Okay? So we have Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. They're in Moab, and they're like, you know, our life has, has, has taken a turn for this extreme worst. Okay. So Naomi says to her, her daughters-in-laws, uh, I'm going to go, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to go back to the land of Israel to my people. This, this is a, this is, there's no good for me here in Moab. I'm an outsider. Uh, it's not good for me. I'm going to go back to, to, um, to Israel. The, uh, the daughters-in-law are Moabites, and so let me pause the storytelling here, and let's look at what that means, because, you know, Moabites to us here is like, you know, what is, what, what, what's that saying to us? Okay. The history of the Moabites is that they were a people uh, that were actually descendants of Lot. And so if you go way back to Avram, remember Avram? Uh, Abraham. Uh, Abraham had a nephew that was Lot, and one of his kind of illegitimate children 
uh, ended up being Moab. And so you might say, well, I don't understand why there's this conflict between the Israelites and the Moabites if they're sort of like distant family. Like maybe we could find them in this book, you know? Like are they, are they close enough? However, uh, Deuteronomy 23 tells us this. Tells us this. No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even in the 10th generation. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live. <laughs> now that's pretty significant. That's like... Don't be close with the Moabites or the Ammonites. You know, they're not your friends. And so with that in mind, uh, Naomi kindly says to these daughters-in-laws, I'm going back there, but you, you don't want to come. This is not going to be a good place for you. Orpah, that's one of the daughters-in-law, uh, Orpah says, I appreciate you. I love you, Naomi. Uh, thanks, but I, okay, I'll just stay here. And she stays. Uh, in Ruth, we meet a very tremendous person. Like, this is somebody to really, really uh, be impressed by. And, and here's why. Ruth says to Naomi this. So this is her response to Naomi. Naomi says, you better stay here. My people are not going to like you, but I'm going back there. Here's what Ruth says. She says, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Um, today we're going to find three, in four chapters, we're going to find three people who point to Jesus. In Ruth, we've met our first one, and here's why. Ruth forgoes her own personal glory for the sake of relationship. She foregoes her own personal glory for the sake of relationship. She says something like this. Um, I know that my future is likely to be worse if I go with you. I know that I'm not going to have the ideal life that I might have dreamed of as a little kid. If I go with you, I'm going to be an outsider. It's going to be more difficult for me. But because I care about you, I'm going to still go. And it's for exactly this reason, I, I, I hope, that this passage is read oftentimes at, at weddings, right? Isn't that the same kind of sense of things? I'm marrying you. I'm going to forgo whatever it is that's good for, for me for the sake of the other, for the sake of, of, of you. And so um, we find, and, and this is where, your, again, your Jesus radar would go off if you're thinking about who's the kind of person that forgoes personal glory for the sake of relationship. Um, in Jesus, we find someone who's 100% committed to us, so much so that he's going, to, going to, to humble himself, going to diminish himself, to come down to do good on our behalf, to sacrifice himself for us. It's the same kind of thing. Okay, uh, we got to continue because we got to still find two more. We found Ruth. We got to find two more people that point to Jesus. All right. So um, next thing that happens is uh, Naomi and this Moabitess. Uh, basically return the trip up around the Dead Sea and head back to Bethlehem. Remember, Christmas is coming. Um, they uh, go there, and at the risk of her life, Ruth goes out as this foreigner Moabitess. She goes out to glean in the fields, and she happens upon the field of this guy named Boaz. And Boaz is described uh, in, in the book as a man of standing, and Ruth is there gleaning, and Boaz goes up to her, and he basically says something like, uh, yes, feel free to glean here, and by the way, if you need a break, you can rest over here, and if you need some water, we'll help you with some water. We're going to be generous towards you. Now, here's how I've always pictured this. And I, re I think the reason I pictured this is because even as a kid, I, I saw pictures of Ruth. And I thought, you know, whatever this whole Moabitess thing, whatever, but didn't Boaz just find her attractive? And he's just like, okay, so here's this pretty girl gleaning, and, you know, maybe I want to get married, so, like, let me be kind to her. She's, you know, she's a foreigner, I know, but she has those, you know, foreign eyes or whatever the case may be, and he's just, he's just interested in her. Um, the issue is, <laughs> that's kind of taking our 2020 mindset back into the text. And so the Bible, like the Bible always does, is awesome because it just tells us what, what we need to know. So here's what the Bible says. Um, Ruth asked Boaz, and, and I don't know how I missed this in all the years of thinking about this. She says, why have I found favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? So she basically says, well, why is it that you're being nice to me? Like, t tell me why. Here, here's uh, Boaz's reply. 
he says, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So Boaz isn't like, oh, you know, you're attractive and I need a wife and I just happen to notice you in the field here. No, no, no. He says, I, I heard, I'm guessing they did not have like Bethlehem alerts, like Mifflin County alerts on Facebook back then. But uh, this seems to be the kind of thing where it's like word travels and Boaz gets the information, like, why is this foreigner here? Oh, she came back with, she risked her life. She, she, she put away her own glory for the sake of her relationship to Naomi. That's why she's here. And Boaz heard that news and he said, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty impressive thing. And so how does Boaz respond to that? He's going to do the same kind of thing. So at first, he's going to say, yeah, glean here, I'll take care of you, all that sort of stuff. And the book, here, here's what's awesome about the book of Ruth. It could end right there. Boaz could be the kind of person, because um, in uh, Deuteronomy uh, 23, I think it is, uh, there's, a, there's a passage that says, oh, Deuteronomy 24, there's a passage that says leftover grain was supposed to be available to the widow, to the orphan, and to the foreigner. Well, isn't it fascinating? Ruth is all three. She, she like checks box one, two, and three. She's all three of those things. And Boaz says, you know, he could be kind to her, and the book could end there, and he's kind of a man of the law that does what he's supposed to do. He's kind of following what, what, the, what the Bible says, um, but it doesn't end there. And this is where things get really, really awesome. Okay, it doesn't end there because uh, Naomi and Ruth are going to hash this plan, right? They're not going to be necessarily even just like, uh, they're, they're going to take another level of risk based on Boaz's generosity. So here's what they're going to do. Naomi says to Ruth, and this is why, Another reason why the Bible is awesome and probably more interesting, I think, sometimes than the Christians that's supposed to follow the Bible. The Bible is like more interesting than sometimes we can be. Um, and so in the Bible, what happens is Naomi and Ruth kind of get together. They get Ruth all dressed up. They get perfume on, like you're allowed to wear perfume in the Bible, so that's kind of cool. They get perfume on, and Ruth goes out to, uh, to Boaz at night. He's kind of protecting his grain. So he harvests his grain from the field. The harvesters did all that. They have this big pile of grain there, and he's sleeping there because he doesn't want anyone to come steal it. And Ruth goes out to him, and she, she um, again, it's, it's, it's in the Bible. You, you just got to read it. It's in the Bible. It's awesome. Uh, she goes out to him, and she says to Boaz, Ruth says, spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. And we're like, what? you know, 2020, we're like, what on earth is happening in this, in this situation? Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. So let's pause a second and investigate this idea of guardian redeemer. The Hebrew word here is goal, goal. You guys want to practice some, some Hebrew, right? Goal. Yeah, it's like goal, but just kind of pause in the middle. Goal. Okay, there we go. So that's, that's your Hebrew lesson for the day. And uh, what it's referencing is a passage from back in Leviticus. Here, here's what Leviticus 25, 25 says. And this seems odd in the context, so I'm going to have to explain it. Uh, Leviticus 25, 25 says, If one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to, is to come and redeem what they have sold. Well, this is confusing to us, because here we have Ruth, and this is like, seems like it's a, it's a personal interaction, like he's going to get Ruth, but this passage only talks about land. And the way this would have worked is as follows. So when Elimelech and, and Naomi had this issue, uh, theoretically they sold, they sold some land at a, at a lesser value than what, it was, what they could have gotten otherwise. And so a guardian redeemer is allowed to come back and buy that land at full price and kind of restore it to the family at large. And so that's what, what uh, Boaz is talking about here. Well, with the land comes the people that are, the, the women that are connected to that land. And so that's why there's a connection between Ruth, you know, getting connected to Boaz as well as the land itself. So Boaz says basically, yes, I'll be the goal. I'll, I'll be that person for you. Um, but we have an issue. And I assume, I don't know if they had this kind of guy back then, but I assume he, re he referred to this and he's like, okay, there's one person a little closer in relationship than me uh, to Naomi to Elimelech. So he goes to that person. And he says, um, do you want to be the guardian redeemer? 
do you want to be the Goel? And this man says, yes, by all means. And so <laughs> now we're sort of stuck because there's this connection between Boaz and Ruth, but this other guy says, yes, he'll be the guardian redeemer. And uh, we're still at that same question of, you know, why, how, how does Ruth personally play a part in this whole thing? So um, Boaz very cleverly is going to say to that other person, um, yes, you're allowed to buy the land, but if you buy the land, do you know what's going to happen? Do you know that you're going to get this Moabitess Ruth? And in my mind, it's in, in that second, uh, really helps us to understand the, the, the depth of what's happening in this story. Because that other person, he backs out. He, he, he kind of, you know, awkwardly or shyly or whatever says, oh, oh, wait, I didn't know that I was going to get this foreigner Moabitess in this deal because I don't want to take that level of embarrassment upon my family. I don't want to risk what it looks like to have her with us. So I'll just back out of that deal. It, it was fine to just get the land, but if I'm going to get her, count me out. That's what this other person says. And that, it's crucial that we get that because we have to understand what Boaz is doing. Is not saying, oh, here's a random foreign, you know, attractive woman that I'm just kind of getting in my... No, no, no. He's risking a level of, embar of personal embarrassment in order to do this transaction. So this other guy backs out and Boaz says, yes, then I will be the guardian redeemer of the family. And so in Boaz, uh, we find our second person that points to Jesus. And here's why. Oftentimes, I think we as Christians think that the main thing of our Christian life is to live a level of personal holiness. In other words, I'm going to do what I'm required to do to follow the law, right? I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to do my end of the deal. Everyone else out there, they can kind of do what they want to do, but I'm just going to do what's right for me to do. And what does Boaz do? He, he does that, right? Because the law said, the, the fatherless, the orphan, the foreigner, you have to provide grain for them to glean in the fields. And he does all that. He, he does his, what he's obligated to do according to the law, right? He does that. But the beautiful thing about Boaz is he does not stop there. He doesn't say, I'm just going to do what I have to do to be a look, look on the outside like a good Christian. He doesn't just say that. He says, I'm going to go beyond that, and I'm going to risk personal embarrassment for the sake of intimate relationship. I'm going to risk personal embarrassment for the sake of intimate relationship. And so what Boaz does is he takes Ruth into this family, risking. I mean, did you hear the passage? It said, you know, no Moabite, no Ammonite is allowed in the 10th generation to be part of this, this family. He's going to risk embarrassment for the sake of the good of the other and so obviously we find uh, in, that, in that situation the second pointer to Jesus. Because what does Jesus do, right? Jesus doesn't just come and say, I'm the, I'm the perfect person who is going to be 100% obedient to the, the Israelite law. I'm going to follow all the commands. I'm going to do everything right. He doesn't just do that. He does that, right? He does that perfectly better than all of us. But he goes beyond that to say, I'm going to be spit on. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to get the crown of thorns. I'm going to be, you know, taken and hung embarrassingly on a cross for the good of the other. Um, Boaz goes beyond faithfulness to the law to sacrifice for intimate relationship. And it's not just, I mean, it's intimate, it's marriage. There's no other humanly intimate relationship than that, right? Um, in the midst of the sin and craziness, the downward spiral of the book of Time of Judges, it's so awesome. And I found the book of Ruth really refreshing to see some pictures of what this could look like of two individuals so far that have sacrificed their own kind of personal glory for the sake of intimate relationship, right? Like Boaz is for Ruth because Ruth is for Naomi. It's, it's just a beautiful chain of this sort of thing. Um, but I said earlier that there's three people <laughs> in this Four chapter book that point to Jesus. There's three people. So far we have Ruth and we have Boaz. Who in the world is the third one? Okay. So uh, as the story happens, um, Boaz and Ruth are married and Ruth has a son. Ruth has a child. And um, as I could kind of imagine, it seems like Bethlehem is like a small town area, right? And I could kind of imagine the women of that area gathering around Ruth and, and uh, the scripture says that this is what they say to, um, this is what they say to Naomi, right? So the, the grandmother, right? 
They say, praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. Right? Praise be to the Lord, Naomi. You have a guardian redeemer. May he become famous. And we're left to think, right, that that is Boaz, right? Like he's the one because of his goodness that has brought, you know, Naomi was in this far land, no men, and now she's back here, and she has kind of under the, the protection of, of a male leader, but also that she is um, connected, and there's this, this grandchild of hers that's not by blood, but, but by family grandchild. Um, but that's not, <laughs> that's not it. Um, Boaz is not the person. Let's keep reading. It says, uh, he will renew your life. Okay, let me, let me go back. Praise be the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer, a goal. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, that's Ruth, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, which is a real big deal back then because seven is perfect and sons are theoretically better to have because you keep the family going. Better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Wait, what? I thought Boaz was the Goal. How's, how's, how's the baby the Goal? And so... Uh, I think in a, in a very real sense, and I'm, I am not, nor will I ever be, a grandmother. But I get the sense that for a grandmother, the idea, and even though it's not technically through Naomi's blood, uh, the idea of having a grandchild there as a, as a, a way, a, a, a life-giving source, you know, someone they can love on and dote on and all that kind of grandparently things, I think that's like a reality here. So there's, there's that part of it. But how else is this baby to go out? Well, you see, um, Ruth and Boaz had this son, and his name was Obed. And if you know any of the story, or if you've ever read um, <laughs> that, bo- let's go back to boring genealogies, right? If you've ever read that boring genealogy from Matthew chapter 1, it says this. It says, Boaz is the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And if you're an Israelite, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal that you're right there in the line of King David. Uh, and then Matthew chapter 1, will conti- that genealogy will continue to go on to say, eventually that line leads to none other than Jesus himself. So we've come full circle. <laughs> we've come back to genealogies. And the question is, sort of how do, uh, the, the core question at the beginning, how do glory and relationship coexist? Like, how, how do we get both? Instead of just seeking both, how do we get both? Um, in this book, we found two people, uh, both Ruth and Boaz, who forsook, who, who, who put away their own personal glory for the sake of relationship. Put away their own personal glory for the sake of relationship. And because they did that, <laughs> that led to their love, which led to their child, which led us to Jesus. And in Jesus, we find the perfect individual, the perfect, in, the perfect uh, individual, and, and this is what Philippians will say about Jesus. It, it says, uh, so Paul wrote this about Jesus. It said, He, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In other words, <laughs> Jesus was the perfect example of saying, I'm not going to seek out my own personal glory. I'm going to humble my glory, become obedient to death for the sake of relationship. But then, in like the turn of all turns, right, this is how it's, it's just so awesome, uh, the Philippians passage goes on to say, therefore, in other words, because he did that, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So how did Jesus get glory? He got glory by giving away glory for the sake of relationship, and then he ends up with glory as the, as the kind of surprise byproduct at the end. And so what does this mean for any of us today, whether you're here or watching online or whatever? I think it means something like, um, in any way we can kind of make feasibly possible uh, to go forward in life, to look for ways to set aside our own personal glory, to not strive or focus on or desire or want to, 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 to lift up in front of others our own personal glory, to set that aside for the sake of relationship. And what we might find in that is that We get to be caught up in the glory, not of our own doing, because the issue is really this, 
<laughs> if we spend all of our life propping our own glory up, we know at two in the morning when you're, when you're awake from, from sleeping that maybe I'm not actually worth that much glory as I, as I want to show off to everybody else. Like, like maybe that's not the reality for my life. You know, and we're stuck with those thoughts. Like how, how, how are we dealing with that? But if we put, us, put aside our own glory, we can get wrapped up in the glory of, of Christ for the sake of relationships with others. Now I'm almost done, but I, I just want to leave uh, with a few practical ways. Because I feel like, to me, this message is, you know, is simple, uh, but it might not be, uh, like, how does that actually get worked out in our lives? That might be a little bit more of a challenge. So I want to leave with four kind of practical ways. If you want to set aside your own personal glory for the sake of relationship, here are some ways that that might happen. Number one, it seems simple, but don't talk about yourself. Don't talk about yourself. Instead, ask questions to others and then actually listen. Or like, how do we love relationship? We love relationship by saying, what I have to say to you, like my own personal glorified speech of my wisdom and greatness, set that aside and, and listen and care for what somebody else might be saying. Number two, to live a generous life. We can try to prop up our own personal glory by saying, look how much money I have, look how much free time I have, look how, much, um, uh, sk- how many skills I have, look at all my abilities, I-, I learned this skill, I can do this, I can do this, check me out, I'm awesome, I'm on Instagram, I'm doing whatever. Set that aside and say, how can I use those things for the sake of relationships, not for my own personal glory? Number three, reflect on why you might feel so strongly about defending your actions to others. I know the mask thing is like a big thing right about now. And I, I sometimes wonder, like, ha, ha, when, we try to, when we try to defend our actions to others, are we really saying something like, you better honor me because I know, you know, I have all the insight on what's the, the best thing for everybody. Number four, uh, intentionally brag about others. Instead of trying to slip in those comments about how you're great, uh, find somebody that's doing something great and tell someone else about them. To me, the healthiest sense of community, and this is what I'd love to see for our church, is a community where people are intentionally speaking highly, not gossiping, not the, oh, but did you hear, oh, but, uh, speaking highly about all the other people around us, like intentionally bragging about other people. That's a way to put aside our own glory and lift up the glory in the relationships of others. So again, I'll I'll close and just say, here's the the kicker of the whole thing to me is that when we put aside our own personal glory by God's grace, when we can put that aside, and when we can um, focus on the good of relationships, um, I think we might find, kind of surprisingly, (laughs) find the freedom to share in the glory of Jesus Christ who did that in the the best and most uh, incredible way, way ever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you as just um, the person who, uh, like all of us, struggles, uh, struggles in how um, I feel about, you know, how everyone's viewing me or, or are they thinking highly of me or um, is what I'm, are the actions that I'm doing that are observable to other people uh, impressive to them and those kinds of issues. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll help me uh, and help all of us to be able to set aside our own personal sense of, of caring about our, our glory and to be able to remove that um, for the sake of healthy relationships, for the sake of love of the other, and that uh, in, in doing so, we would do it um, by your power um, as a way of, of uh, partaking or participating in the work that you are about in this world of, of uh, reaching out in love to others. I pray this all in your name.